discussion is, is it central? So differential diagnosis of dizziness. Uh, I work in a, in a regional medical center. It's um, a huge hospital, 700 beds. Uh, so I see a lot of people that come in the door uh, very dizzy after traumas, sometimes you know, not having traumas. They just come in because they're dizzy. The physicians don't know how to examine these people. Uh, so they usually call me in to look at, at the, the dizzy patients for them. So what I'm going to do is share with you what I do when I do an examination because there's no reason that you can't do the exact same examination when you're screening your patients. Um, I found this uh, on the internet yesterday. So we were talking about getting neurooptometric research out. And I have my phone set up to get me alerts of new articles that came out. And this actually just hit my phone yesterday. And it's treatment of vestibular disorders uh, with weak asymmetric basin prisms. So I thought that was kind of interesting that, you know, while I was here that, that this hits. Uh, so I just wanted to share that with you. So the vestibular world is working on the research. So hopefully uh, more people will as well. So you saw my history, so you know that I'm heavily into vestibular. And what I noticed a lot um, during the past couple days is when you look at a patient, you see the guy on the left. And when I look at a patient, I see the guy on the right. So I think it's interesting, and, but it's important that we all work together for this very reason. So I'm, I'm a vestibular expert, but I'm certainly not an ocular motor or eye expert. I can screen it, but then when I find something, I have to send them to, to uh, a neurooptometrist. And I, I frequently put uh, referrals to the neurooptometrist, and there's one in our state, by the way, she's in the room, Susan Jong. Um, but I, you know, it's, it's a roll of the dice whether or not they get sent, because I can't write the referral, the, the attending physician has to write the referral. So it's very important that you try to get into your hospitals. We need you badly. All right, uh, disclosures, I have none for this talk, but I do get royalties from my publisher, so this is a not so subtle hint that I have a book. And the book actually walks you through the evaluation process. It has pictures all the way through. Step by step, step one, step two, step three, there's pictures. There's videos to show you as well. So if you're interested in doing vestibular examination or examining anyone who has dizziness or balance issues, uh, I would say this is a good book. All right, so the objectives for the, the, objectives for the talk, to, uh, when we're done, hopefully you'll be able to identify the most common causes of dizziness, list signs and symptoms of vestibular dysfunction, Describe classic symptoms of BPPV, that's the crystals that are loose. Name three cerebellar bedside tests. List at least three central signs of dysfunction, and there are many. And identify the three parts to the HINTS examination. So the HINTS examination actually has been out for quite a while. I think it was in the 90s when it was first published. But it's just now starting to get traction, uh, and it's a very good test. So this slide looks at the causes of dizziness. And this is according to Tim Hain, who's a neurotologist in Chicago. He's a huge researcher as well. And according to Dr. Hain, at least half of the people that complain of dizziness have an ear issue. That's huge. Uh, a quarter of them, we never figure out what made them dizzy. So that's 75% of the people. And then what's left, 15% is psychological, 5% is medical, and 5% is neurologic. So that's kind of astounding to me, um, but I'm here to talk about the difference between central ideology and peripheral ideology. So why do we have to worry about the central stuff? And there's just uh, lists of examples of each of those categories. So why do we have to worry about the neurologic? Because potentially it's life-threatening. Uh, oh, and just so you know, I, I, I updated the slides, so if your slides look different, if you go to the, to the website, the email that they sent you saying, here's the, the the handouts for day one and day two, and there's a new, new slide set up there for you. So when do you consider a patient who has dizziness to have something sinister? Um, primarily when the, the presentation is atypical for a peripheral vestibular issue, and we're going to learn how to decide that uh, today. And also when there are other red flags present, such as cerebellar signs or symptoms that they're complaining about. I'm going to present two cases, so I'm going to give you the histories now, and then we're going to learn how to examine the patient, and then we'll go over the findings. 
So the first case is a 68-year-old man, and these are both patients I've seen in the pa this past year, who presents to the emergency department with the room spinning, blurred vision, headache, and a fall to the ground. And after he fell on the ground, he passed out, and then after 30 minutes, they decided to call the emergency medical system. He denies chest pain or shortness of breath. He does endorse recent sinus congestion. So I'm just going to break this down. When I read this history, already you're, you're trying to figure out what's causing it just based on the history, right? So I'm reading through this. And I'm like, all right, blurred vision, headache, fall to the ground, and the room is spinning. Well, that sounds vestibular. Anytime you hear the room is spinning, it's vestibular. What we have to decide is if, if it's in the ear or if it's in the brain. So then you keep reading through his history. Um, he denies chest pain or shortness of breath, so then you think, okay, well, it doesn't sound like it's cardiac. But then you look at his previous medical history, and he has coronary artery disease. Um, he had a cardiac bypass graft surgery. So there are some cardiac, uh, there, there's cardiac history there. So I keep it in the back of my mind, but, but just based on what I'm hearing, it doesn't sound like it's cardiac to me. Uh, he has other, other issues such as hypothyroidism that can cause dizziness. Uh, the chronic kidney disease isn't going to cause dizziness unless it's hypotension, but hypotension doesn't cause the room to spin, so that doesn't fit. All right, socially, he's married, um, denies smoking or drinking alcohol or using illicit drugs. Uh, he was admitted to the hospital and uh, they ordered vestibular therapy. You can see his blood pressure is fairly normal. Pulse rate and respiration is normal. His oxygen, uh, uh, partial pressures of oxygen are normal. He's oriented. Uh, so they ran a CT scan, which everybody that comes in our hospital gets a C CT scan. And I was sitting next to a physician charting one day, and, and he was complaining that his patient came in with a, with, a, with a cold and they ran a CT scan. So they run CT scans on everybody. So what did the CT scan find? Well, no, nothing acute, and they find uh, mild ethmoid sinusitis, and that's usually what it finds. And he recommended an MRI and uh, PT. So the patient was admitted. The hospitalist then takes over, uh, who's an internist. The hospitalist orders a vestibular evaluation because she sees spinning dizziness in the history and just decides that she doesn't need an MRI because the patient clearly has a vestibular issue. <laughs>